Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I've just got a, a little video here that we're going to share. Uh, moving on from previous videos that we've talked about the history of CalCF um, and where it all began, we've now got some um, some new information we want to get across. Uh, it's called Pathways, Stories from CalCF. Uh, the idea is we're going to invite on previous players back to talk about their time, their experiences with CalCF and hence uh, the title talk about the pathways and what choices they've made since moving on regards to education, football, um, and it will go on to where they are and what they do now. So the first guest that we have got on is Matty Dye, uh, also known as Dyak. So welcome, Matty. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. Me. Um, so yeah, I won't give too much away, but um, obviously, from the description, Matty is a, a previous player. He's been uh, around KLCF back when it was West Norfolk Schoolboys and sort of through the transition to Kings in Advance. So um, he's got the nickname Diag. So that's the first question I'm going to ask you, Matty, is uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's a football related answer, but where did the, the nickname Diags come from? Yeah, it's, it's caught on quite heavily. Even the boys at Peter call me Diags now, some of the younger lads. But um, yeah, it started when I started playing at Fakenham. So we had a lad called Lee Day who played centre centre back next to me and for whatever reason he start, started calling me Diags. I think partly because of my surname, but also the fact that I, I love to hit a Diag as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the that was the reason. Yeah, that was sort of the idea that I got. Maybe you liked a, a cross field yeah. pass of some description, yeah. but no, it's good. It's better than the, uh, the the way I got my nickname anyway. Obviously a lot of people in the football world <laughs> call me Bully, and that came about through somebody mispronouncing my surname. Um, they, they thought my surname was Bullyman rather than Bullman, and that's how my... And they just stick, don't they? Especially in football, but it, it can be tricky sometimes when you're coaching and someone calls you by your nickname, the kids can give you a funny look as if to say, where's that come from? What's that? How, what, is that your name? Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's managed to stick so far, so we'll see how long it lasts. Yeah, all right. So we've got Matty Dye, uh, aka Dyke. So yeah, I've got a, a series of questions we're just going to run through. Um, and for the purposes of the, the video, everyone can sort of see the questions come up on the screen, but I will also ask them because we're going to um, take the audio and put it into a podcast as well. So Matt, first one, can you share your first memories of being a player with KLCF uh, and how it all started for you? Yeah, I was... So looking through the questions yesterday, just having a little thing. So um, it was a long time ago, actually. Um, I think the first memory I have was actually a schools competition when uh, the community football used to come into the high schools or the junior schools and, and put on a tournament. That was the first memory I had. And then I, I attended a PDC for a week. Um, and then after that session, they invited me to advanced PDC in Hunstanton. Um, and then immediately after that, I think they started to put together the West North schoolboys groups for my age group. Yeah, so I think yeah. I must have been maybe under 11 or under 12 at the time. Um, and that's when I remember the old sand base Astro at Linsport. So yeah. that's, that's um, yeah, that's that's the first memory I have. Yeah, the old sand base. Yeah, when we first started there, it was, uh, it was, it was like a hockey pitch, really. It was sort of yeah. what it was used for. And yeah, it wasn't. The best football surface, but it's come a long way since then. Yes. So yeah, but um, through the high school and, and back in uh, the Hunstanton PDC days, is sort of where you began, or the steps began for you. Um, yeah. So during your time in the football program, what experiences did you gain from the training and playing with the other other talented footballers? Yeah, um, loads of different memories and uh, I met loads of different coaches and, and also made loads of friends. So um, I think the, the first thing that stood out to me is that when we joined the West Norfolk Schoolboys, the amount of different lads from different um, teams we played. So uh, back then I was playing for Dersingham and then I started to play for Downham as a youth. Um, but the, the lads in the squads were all from different clubs. So that was the, the, the one of the big things, really. I made loads of new friends, um, all from different squads that you'd usually play against in the league games or maybe in tournaments in the summer, but you didn't know them very well. And um, that that West Norfolk schoolboys group brought us all together. Um, so that was that was one of the big things. And then I think you get in your own uh, local club, you get used to being maybe one of the better players and 
and getting a lot of success in your local league. But what it gave me is it stretched me as a player. You're suddenly training against really good players um, as well. You're not always going to be the best player at training and also in your, in your fixtures. So I think it stretched you from that point of view as well. And on top of that, obviously you're getting... Um, in your local club, a lot of the time it's relying on, on dads to coach you and, and grassroots volunteers. So what it gave me as well was almost that um, that first experience of real coaching, if, if I'm being honest. I mean, some of the grassroots volunteers do a brilliant job of creating an environment and, and whatnot. But when I when I joined the, the programme, you start to understand, you know, what what um, what difference... Uh, uh, experienced coach can have on you as a player so yeah they're, they're the they're the things that stood out to me the most yeah, good good um so through your hard time as a player do you, do you have a highlight moment matty could you think of one it might be a game or you know a training session or i don't know if you ever went on any yeah. of the tours yeah so loads of different uh good memories but from from a single fixture i remember we used to play Deerham. used to go to Deerham oldest park um I think it was once a season, if I remember rightly. Yeah, um, there used to be a little um, little competition that would have between the two clubs and uh, all the age yeah. groups would play and then the, the, the most winners would receive, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was a lucky trophy. Yeah, um, so yeah, I remember that. And um, we played there, I must have been maybe under, I'm guessing maybe under 14s and we played there, uh, we played Deerham in, in that competition and I remember scoring um, from, it was on the first team pitch, so it felt, Especially when you're 13, 14, it feels like a real big deal playing at Deerham because it's an, obviously a nice ground. But mm. I remember scoring, sticking one in the top top pins. Um, I didn't score many goals for Kingsland actually because I tended to play deeper um, at left back. So I remember scoring one and sticking one in the in the top pin. So that was a nice feeling. I can't remember if we won or lost the game, but yeah, that springs to mind. Yeah, that was a good moment. So just on that then, so so what sort of positions when you was uh, around the, sort of the the, the program as West Norton Schoolboys and Kings and Pass. What what positions did you predominantly play? Yeah, um that was a, a big part of it as well. I actually learned different positions. For for my local team, I was like I said, I, I was one of the more dominant players and they used to play me maybe in more advanced positions, maybe central midfield, maybe uh, on the wing or up front. But when I joined Kings Lynn, um I learned different positions. So I, I mainly played for for Kings I mainly played um, left fullback or, or left midfield, and I think the old I got the more I gravitated to left back when I played for Kings Lynn. Um, mm. So that was a in itself that was a real big learning point for me as well. Yeah, good. Um, I know you sort of touched on this um, briefly, but you obviously you are a, a local boy, although you now uh, you've moved uh, to the city of Peterborough. But what schools and clubs did you attend as a junior player? Yeah, I touched on it briefly, but yeah, I'm I'm a Dersingham boy, so I went to Dersingham Junior School, um, and that's where I started playing as well. So I started playing around four or five for Dersingham Miners at the time, um, and then when I got to eleven, I joined. So back then, under elevens, I think it was under elevens or under twelves, they played eleven v eleven. So mm. um, at that point, Downham sort of handpicked some some players from from different clubs um, and we all come together to form this 11 v 11 team um, and we had some real success in, in the league in the mid Norfolk league I think it was called at the time um, at, at the same time I was still playing for Kings and Community Football all the way through that period um, and then under 14s or under 15s I think it was under 15s um, down and folded so um, I had a bit of a decision to make in terms of my my local team so I, I joined Heacham Future miners who had a lot of school friends and um, some of a couple of lads from Downham also joined us. So we had a we had a half decent team, but um, it was I had a good mix then. I had Kings in Community Football where I was playing real um, some really strong players and and a different type of friend. And then I had my local team Heacham where I was playing with my school friends. So I enjoyed both and, and the mix was quite nice actually. Yeah, good, good. And I guess from from Dursingham, what what high school did you go go on to? Yeah, I went to Smithton in Hunstanton. Yeah, um, so near the seaside. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we like every high school. We had a school team. We had some good players, but um, the 
the best teams, to be honest, were, were Kez at the time. I think Kez was probably the best school team. Um, so we weren't we weren't the best school team, but um, we still enjoyed the games. Yeah. So, I mean, this question hasn't been put on there, Matt, but I'm thinking if you could, um, so sort of your age group for, for high school football and obviously local football, who was uh, the main man around at your time? Or who was like the strongest person you ever come up against at junior football level? Yeah, um, locally, because, you know, when you're young, you, you get to hear about local players. And I know all these lads really well now, but um, yeah. I used to play against Kez and I used to play against Kieran Beale too, um, and Mike Clunan, yeah. uh, who obviously Mike's um, gone on and captain Kings Lynn. Um, and Kieran, so they were both in the Norwich system at the time. So when we used to play against them in the league, in the league games, uh, the school games, that was really um, competitive, to be honest. And that was something I actually really looked forward to because I didn't really get that challenge in the in the local league. So yeah, yeah. they were always uh, good games and and also eye openers for, for how good those two were back then as well. Yeah, and I guess that's you know that's some benefits of school football, isn't it? Because those players wouldn't have played in your local league because of their um, restrictions at their academy team but you know come school games it some, sometimes opens up opportunities to play against you know some players that might be in an environment like that yeah absolutely good um, so you completed your last season with uh, KLC FC who's with us as an under 16 did you have any ideas about what you wanted to do um, and where you were going to go at that age in terms of football career or education or just a, you know a career itself yeah, I think under 16 is actually, for me personally, a real confusing time and a real, um, it's a real big time for, for you, a big time in your life, I think, because you're about to leave school. Under 16s naturally is a, a graduation point for football as well, because, you, you know, you, that's the end of junior football as such. I know you have under 18s, but it's yeah. a real big moment. Um, I, If I can remember rightly, I was probably a little bit... Um, probably confused and a little bit unsure about what the future held for me to be honest in, in football and also um career wise I was I was um probably wise enough to know that I probably wasn't going to make it as a professional so I'd accepted that quite early on um but in terms of football as an under 16 I was invited to to start training with the, the Kingsley youth team at the time and the senior teams but that was the season that Kingsley folded. So they, they folded that year. So then I had to leave Kingsley um, and I joined uh, joined Downham Market. Um, so I started playing for their their youth teams um, and also senior teams. And in terms of education and career wise, I was torn between either college or sixth form. But ultimately, I decided to go to college. I think the, the sport side to it and the football side to it sort of draw me in a little bit and I, I was I was real pleased that I made that decision in the end yeah good good so that sort of brings on to the question about um the college because you spent two years there um studying sport and you continued to play because I remember when you was a, a student at the college playing in the, the men's education program at that time I was uh, the coach of the the female team yeah. Um, but those two years you were there, um, as you studied, did priorities change in, in pathways through, you know, life and football? Yeah, I mean, I loved college. It was a great decision for me to join college. Socially, it was great. And also the the fact that we play football so much, we're training. It was almost like a full-time programme, the, the college scheme. And, um, and the fact that you're doing sport every day in terms of studying as well. I think... Uh, in terms of that life, I think it was a big life decision. It's probably shaped the career I've taken since then. But at the time, when I was studying, I was still unsure about what my career would look like. I wanted to work in sport, ideally football, but I wasn't sure how realistic that was going to be. Um, in the back of my mind, I thought maybe I can become a PE teacher and go off to university and um, maybe get a degree and become a PE teacher. Um, so that was my thought process really and um, we might touch on it in a little bit but I then applied to go to university I was still a little bit unsure about that decision but it was probably the best choice for me at the time because it was like I said I'm still unsure exactly what my career was going to look like so yeah I think um, college gave me that clarity that I wanted to work in sport I just wasn't sure in exactly what capacity at the time 
Yeah. Um, what, did, what did you study at college, Matt? Yeah, so it was like a, a BTEC level three. And the good part of it is it covered a wide range of different modules. So we did things like anatomy, nutrition, um, coaching, analysis, um, things like that. And that gave me a good wide lens, if you like, on sport and the, and the industry of sport. Um, I started, I, I did my level one at college at the time when I was studying FA level one coaching qualification. Um, I, I remember that being horrible, actually. All the lads took um, sessions for each other. Yeah. Um, and as you do, you, you're wallying the sessions <laughs> for your mates, aren't you? And um, that was a horrible experience, to be honest. So I thought there's no chance I won't be a coach. Um, but you know, I, that turned out to be quite wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that they they can be different, can't they? Um, I mean, the coaching sessions have evolved since then. When you used to just you know coach to your friends, and even that was a a different experience to what you would have when you first went out and actually coached a team. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, very different. And during that college period as well, I I was off my own back. I was doing a little bit of work for for different um, companies, coaching in schools. Um, so that gave me a little bit of insight into teaching sport if you like yeah. um i did quite enjoy it i think it was really good for my experience of your communication skills with kids and organizational stuff um but at the back of my mind i still wasn't sure that was for me but all these experiences whether that's college but also the, the work i was doing outside of college i think that looking back at it now i think it benefited me a lot yeah okay Good. I mean, what we touched on this a little bit, but whilst you were at college, you're obviously there two years, so that would have taken you to sort of 18, um, going on 19 years old. So in terms of football, what what teams, I know you touched on, um, you went to down at the under 18s, but sort of beyond that, what teams did you represent through to senior football? Yeah, um, so yeah, like I said, down, so I joined down initially, um, just the youth team, so my old coach for Downham back in the day started to take on the under 18s at Downham. So he asked me to go across. I did. I actually signed for Dersian Rovers at the time, um, who were playing Anglian Combination. Mm. So I signed to play for their first team, but I then transferred senior forms over to Downham as well. So at probably 16, 17, 18, I was playing um, for Downham's first team in, in the Regions League at the time. Um, and we had a really young team and we struggled, to be honest. We were consistently sort of bottom three in that division. But we had some, looking back at now, we had some talented lads playing for us. And it was just a real good learning curve because there, there probably wasn't many other teams around or, or players around that were probably getting that exposure to first team football um, at that age. So that was a real big learning curve. We had people like Matty Castellan playing for us and and quite a few others like Luke Pearson that have, um, who were like, again, they were 16, 17 at the time. So we had, a, like I said, a really young team. And then um, when I was at university, so it was probably 19 at the time, Fakenham, Fakenham signed me. Um, same division at the time, but m towards the top of that division. And then I think it was the following season, the second season I was there, we, we got promoted into the Premier. It's called the Furlow Nun league now but we got promoted to the premier division yeah. i was there for quite a few seasons and I, that was a real good time to be honest it was probably the best time i've had in, in senior football it's a good, real... uh, good community club over there isn't it if they can have yeah. got some good people yeah um, real yeah great people there facilities really nice real family feel to it um and we had a real close-knit change room that stayed together for a long time and to be fair some of the lads are still there now yeah um and we 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 done well. Like we when we got in the Premier Division, we didn't we didn't we weren't outstanding by any means, but we we survived and, and we had a decent team. And there were some good division uh, good teams in that division as well. So yeah, that was a real good time. We got to the Senior Cup final at Carra Road as well, where we played Kings Lynn. We lost two 0 but that was a good achievement in itself to get to get to that point. Yeah. And then um, that sort of coincided really with me sort of graduating from university and starting employment. Um, so it, it became harder for me to play football, to be honest, and, and train. But I did sign for Kings in Reserves from Fakenham. Um, and that was, I played for a few games for other teams since then, but I've 
sort of <laughs> retired from playing now. Um, yeah, you, you do get to an age, don't you, where you sort of do have to make a decision based on, you know, you, you've got work commitments and as much as we would like to sort of try and get out of work and play football, so there does come a point, doesn't there, when you have to sort of say, look, f- football has now got to come second. It's hard. Yeah. It's a hard decision to make, isn't it? But uh, there comes a time when we do all have to do that. But Yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I miss playing, but like you say, it's a sacrifice that has to be made. Um, the pure time that I, I've had to put into my job and the, and the hours, it just it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work to, to keep playing, but I love what I do now and um, I've still got those memories. But yeah, uh, the the good thing part, the good thing of it is I've not, some people will ruin their bodies playing football for, for a long period of time. Um, and and by the time they've stopped playing, they've, they're not in a good position to to, to coach with, uh, with good knees or good ankles and good joints and whatnot. So yeah. Uh, but on a side yeah, question, well, yeah. sort of what, what fills the gaps then now that now that football's gone? So, for example, I mean, I, I, I don't play very much. I've, I've actually, the only team I'm signed for at the minute is a vets team. And obviously, there's not any football going on. So, you know, a bit of gym work. I, I got into cycling. I don't really enjoy running, but a little bit of running. What, what do you do to sort of fill the gaps that have been void by football? Yeah, I uh, various things, but... Uh, I'll, I'll read quite a lot of stuff. Um, I'll try and exercise, I'll try and keep myself fit. So I'll go for runs regularly. Um, I'll go for bike rides. Um, and to be honest, football's still my main <laughs> main hobby. So I'll be watching football. Like I said, I coach it. So I'm in football every day. Mm. Um, but yeah, they're, 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 they're the main hobbies really, just trying to keep fit and active. Good. Um so, I mean, you've uh, talked a little bit about this. So from leaving college, um, your next steps were to go to Lincoln University. So what did you study um, when you went to university at Lincoln? Yeah, so I studied sports coaching development. So that was a Bachelor of Science degree um, at the University of Lincoln. Uh, so similar to my college course, really, it was a wide range of modules. So we did... Again, we did things like anatomy, physiology, coaching, um, sort of sociolog- sociological um, issues in sport, um, philosophy, um, aspects of learning and development. So it was really wide ranging. And the thought process with that was um, I, can, I can take the degree any way I wanted to. So some people went on and become sports scientists from the degree I, I took. Yeah. Other people um, became teachers, like I've said. So the, that appealed to me, the, the wide-ranging aspect of that. Um, but then, sort of, whilst I was at university, I started doing my Level 2 coaching course. Yeah. Um, and then from that moment, I caught the bug for coaching. And like I said, at college, that wasn't really a big interest of mine. But um, once I reached um, that point, and I become a level two coach. I started doing more and more at university. I caught the bug. Um, and so during that time, I started volunteering at Boston United. So they had a center of excellence, which was yeah. based about 40 minutes down the road. So I used to used to go there midweek and, and coach in, in, in my spare time. Um, and in my second year university as well. So I was playing for the university team. Um, I became player head coach. So again, that, that was a great experience for me. And that was the first real opportunity of me um, leading a team um, yeah. and implementing like a way of playing and things like that. And that was a real interesting experience and, and learning curve because I was coaching people the same age as me, also my friends. So that's a different dynamic of, yeah. of coaching and managing. Um, so yeah, that, that, um, that bug sort of grew and grew. And, and during that period as well, uh, I did, did my UEFA B licence. Um, I started my UEFA B licence in my third year at university. So at that, by that time, I was completely immersed in, in coaching. And that I spoke earlier about maybe being a PE teacher. At that point, I didn't want to be a PE teacher. I realised I wanted to work full-time in football. Yeah. So everything I did from there on was, was geared around that. So roughly what age would you have been when that sort of decision sort of came? Um... 18, I think. Yeah. 18, yeah, 18. So that, like I said, that 
that time between 16 and 18, college and university, I was really unsure. And then, I don't know, it was like a light bulb moment, really. I realised that if I put the work in, um, I think I could be good at this. I think, like most things in life, I think you've, if you put the effort and the hours in, you can become good at something. Yeah. Um, and I think there was a little bit of regret, maybe, from a football point of view, that I didn't maybe push myself more. Um, I'm not saying that I would have been a professional by any means, but I didn't really back myself as a player as much as maybe other people. And yeah. as a result, I didn't put the work in as a player as much as I should have. So when that light bulb moment come with the coaching side of things, I thought, yeah, I'm going to give this a real go. I want, I want to be world-class. That was what I set myself at the time. And I set myself loads of goals and I still have the same goal now. Um, so from that moment, 18 onwards, so the last eight, nine years, I've worked towards becoming um, the best coach I can be. Brilliant. So, um, so on leaving the university, though, Matt, you obviously you returned back to West Norfolk, didn't you? Um, yeah. And you took up the position as uh, the sort of the team leader for our activating committees team, yeah. uh, and also sort of came back in. So full circle, came back into the program, which was now known as Kings and Elite, as um, one of our football coaches. So had had much changed since you was a player. Um. Probably not as much as I thought it, it maybe would have changed. Um, obviously, yourself and, and Jamie were still around. Um, some others, other members of staff as well were still around. So from that point of view, that, that made that quite a, an easy transition. And obviously, the, the kit's still blue and yellow, so you get that familiarity as well. Um, but yeah, obviously, it's a completely different dynamic, being a staff member to being a player, because you, you, when you play, you don't see the ins and outs of it. But... Um, I think what was nice is you still based at the same venue as when, when I trained as a as a young lad, and um, like I said, the likes of yourself and Jamie were were familiar faces, so that made that change and transition quite easy, to be honest. Um, and the 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 role itself, so it was obviously different aspects to the role. Like you said, the active yeah. banking team leader that was. That was a, a really good role for me, actually, um, in terms of, again, my development, that I had to be out and about the community, building relationships, communicating with people and being organised and looking back at that now, that they're skills that I've had to incorporate into my role now. Um, and then on top of that, as you know, there's a lot of coaching hours involved with the school stuff, the elite stuff, and also the college stuff. So all those hours, I think, um, again, really benefited me. Um, as a coach, as a young coach. Good. Um, how does it feel sort of going full circle? You know, it, there probably was a time when you might have been out there on the 3G thinking, you know, I, I was there once, um, you know, as a player running around, you know, coaching um, kids of different ages, up to the age that you probably started. Um, how does it sort of feel coming back full circle? Yeah, it was nice. Um, it was nice because... Ultimately, it wasn't that long ago that I was in their position, so I could, I still felt I could relate to them. Um, I knew sort of what they were feeling. Um, I knew, I knew what was the expectations from from a coach's point of view, because as a player, I used to get told it myself. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a nice feeling. It was a bit of a strange feeling actually, um, because like I said, it wasn't actually that long ago before that I was, as a player, I was in um, that position. So. But yeah, it was a nice, nice to be able to, um, like I say, go go full cycle, go full circle, and um, and do and, and help players just like yourselves did. Um, it was yourself, Jamie, um, Paul, Jess, Michael Sup, all these people that I remember back as a player, um, and now it's it was sort of my turn then to to pass on that that knowledge to, to the people I was coaching and you, you never know it'd be nice to see maybe some of the lads that I coach and you coach and, and Jamie coach become coaches themselves and I know some of them have but um, I'm sure that that'd be a nice feeling to see that yeah it's good I find it's always good when you know you get an old player come back in they, they know sort of the ins and outs and obviously they they come back with you know better experiences better qualifications you know they've all grown up a little bit and like you said, you you know you had various different um, age groups of coach. I remember you actually coming back to to chat to the students at the college as well. So you'd obviously you'd been a 
a player, you've been a, a player at the academy with the college, you then gone to university and you sort of, you came back and you were delivering sessions for the college as well. Um, and you gave them, you know, that night on the award ceremony, a, a really good insight into, you know, your pathway, what you've done. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, obviously, we asked you on here as well. You know, hopefully you'll be able to share all these examples and the pathway that you've taken with um, more people. Because, yeah, that's what we want to see. Um, we all know the percentages. You obviously, you know, working in a club where, you know, the, the chances of um, everyone in a squad becoming a professional player, you know, they are very, very limited. The percentages of them continue to play senior semi-pro football, you know, and lots of them will do. Uh, and hopefully they'll come back as coaches or, you know, continue to work in football one way, one way or another. Yeah, I think that just on that, the industry obviously... And, and the age we're living in now where probably m maybe in my dad's age, if you like, the opportunities back then to work in football weren't there. So um, whilst I didn't have the ability to, to play professionally and I probably gave up that quite quickly and I, I sort of, like I said, I accepted that I probably wouldn't be a professional player quite early on. Um, it, there's, there's loads of different avenues to it. And, and, and like I've spoke about, um, once once you've been given a little taste of something, that you can you can maybe be good at it. If you put the hours in, you can succeed. And um, that's what I'd say to the players at Kings of Community Football. Really, is um, yeah, have aspirations to to become the best player you can be. But along the way, if if that doesn't work out as a player, you've got you've got other things in football you can do as well. And hence my example, yourself, Dan, Jamie, and there's numerous other players that have come through the elite pathway and, and gone on to have careers in, in sport or football or, um, or other really good industries. Yeah. And, and hopefully over the weeks, we'll have um, many more of examples like you to, to sort of share their pathway as well, because everyone's taken a different one. Um, yeah. It sort of starts on sort of the, the path you're on now. So obviously after your time as uh, the activating communities team lead, you've got an opportunity to, um, join a professional football club. Um, so what was the, the transition like? And I guess you can then explain to us where where you are now, although um, there is another question for that coming up. But the, I guess the transition of moving from us to a professional football club. Yeah. Um, so I always, uh, and not everyone has this ambition, but I had the ambition to, to work in professional football. Um, so, yeah, I made that step um, initially part-time. The, the biggest transition really was the amount of traveling I was doing. So I was doing about 100 miles a day. Um, and, and also with coaching, as you know, it's late night. So um, getting back late at night and then, and then back on the road early in the morning. So that was a, a real big um, thing to get my head around. Um, and then in terms of the environment, I mean, there, there's a lot of, and we'll touch on this anyway, there's a lot of similarities between um, the elite, the elite program and also academy program but I think um, the, the the differences if you like is I'm going into an environment where I know no one whereas at, at Kings Lynn I knew people I knew yourself and I knew um, being a local boy I knew some of the players and parents and, and yeah. other staff um, so I'm going to a brand new environment where no one really knows me um, so it's a completely blank slate if you like and it's just about me trying to prove myself um, it just like uh, in the elite program, there's talented players, um, but there's probably there's probably um, more expectation on on players in the academy because, as you know, there's there's a lot of pressure which, which comes with that um, academy environment. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But that's probably the the other big thing that sprang to mind really um, yeah. is the, the pressure for staff and also for players. And some of that pressure isn't always well received and there's obviously um press around the academy environment is it good for is it good for players but i like to think that the positive experiences and skills that players develop in the academy football um outweighs that to be honest yeah. yes we like we spoke about the percentages of making it are low but the the holistic development of the player and the person if you like is something that that's also really stood out being at a professional club, that there's a lot of 
um, resources to help the play in different ways, not just purely on the grass. But um, I mean, at the minute, we've got life skills programs, we've got nutritional programs and things like that, which being a professional club with the funding we get, that gives us that opportunity to do it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's that a, there's a lot more, isn't there, than what, you know, when people used to talk about, okay, there's, there's a lot more um, opportunities around, isn't there, and support, I guess, you know, is, is a word around you said the whole holistic approach to how you how you do develop your players there yeah and we're still trying to improve that all the time um mm -hmm. at our club but in general academy foot we've got so much better for that and um yeah there's, again there's coverage around the aftercare for players once they go but again we're, we're trying to get better at that all the time like we've unfortunately we've had to let some of the 16s go recently um and we've been really supportive in helping them find new clubs, developing like a CV for them, um, staying in contact with them. So we are getting better, better at it. The, the industry needs to get keep improving. Um, but like you say, I think there's there's more to it than what people maybe think there is in academy yeah. football. And um, I I might be biased, but I think there's a lot of um, good outcomes for for players, even if they don't make it professionally. I think there's a lot of benefits to, to being in that environment yeah so I mean when you sort of moved on um, you obviously went there part-time you said so you were sort of I'm assuming was um, maybe an age group coach sort of explain your current role now and um, the steps that you've taken to um, hold that position I guess yeah um, so when I first joined like you say it was a part-time role for, for an age group so I took the under 10s so that was a part-time role, but I, I sort of combined that with uh, a role in their foundation programme where I, again, I was coaching the schools. Um, I was leading a programme called the Premier League Primary Stars programme. So that programme was going around primary schools, supporting primary school teachers to develop um, their skills in, in delivering PE, essentially. So that combined, that was a full-time role. It was full on, like I said, the amount of travelling I was doing because I, I, I still lived... Um, locally in the Kingsland area so it was a, an hour each way so two hour round trip each day and uh, lots of late nights and early starts and things like that um, but yeah so I, I was doing that for a season um, and then um, I was approached by the academy manager at the time to to apply for a full-time role in the academy which was the foundation phase lead coach um, and that role oversaw the the nines to twelves age groups on a full-time basis um and so i accepted that role so i interviewed for that role and i was offered that role accepted that role um and that coincided with the under, uh, under 15 coaches role at the time as well so i had two two strings to my role if you like um again like, like I spoke about earlier on, the amount of hours coaching I was doing on the grass, it was really intensive, which was, again, really good. Daytime with the, the school boys that we had in. Um, so we've got a full-time programme at the club where some of the boys join the school, which is partnered with us, and they train in the daytimes. So I was coaching the daytimes, and in the evenings I had the younger ones who I'd oversee under 9 to 12, which I coached. And then after them ones, I often had the, the older players as well that would come in. Um, mm. So I could be taking, you know, four or five sessions a day at times, um, which is obviously tiring, but it gave me loads of um, opportunities to practice and, and fail and do good things and learn, learn from your mistakes and practice your communication, your organisation, what works, what doesn't work. Um, mm. So that massively benefited me um so I was in that role for a couple of years and then we had we had a bit of a a quite a quick turnover in in staff for the head of coaching role at the club so I think we had three or four in the space of maybe 24 months different heads of coaching and no one really got their teeth into that role and it's an important role it's a new role actually it was a new role at the time um so uh it was mentioned to me by the academy manager like, would I be interested in doing it? Because I've been doing it to a lesser extent with the foundation phase in terms of helping the coaches um, developing a programme, implementing a programme. Mm. But it didn't 
at first I, I said I wasn't interested in the role, but probably a few weeks later I decided that I haven't thought about it. It was something that did appeal to me after all. Um, so I did apply for the role and I was given the role of head of academy coaching is, is the title. So that's where I am today. And, and what my role looks like now is, um, I could just briefly mention, but yeah. twofold, it's um, developing a programme, a coaching programme, um, and then making sure that's implemented by the coaches throughout the age groups from under sevens to uh, now under 23s, which we've got in place. Um, and also the development of coaches. So making sure that the CPD programme we've got in place is, is, a, is a beneficial to them. Um, making sure that they've got their own action plans as coaches as well. So we've got action plans for our players, but um, making sure our coaches' development is important as well. So, yeah, that's that's how my role looks. And um, I really enjoy the role. What a real big benefit to it, and something which I really like personally, is I, I'm probably one of the few people at the club in the academy that knows every player from, you know, from under nines all the way through to under 23s. Yeah. I get to see the full landscape, if you like, and that's something I really enjoy. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where I am today. Um, in terms of sort of personal qualifications, I mean, I, I'm sure you've gained some along the way from, from your level three at uh, university as well. Yeah, so um, during my time as foundation phase lead coach, I enrolled on the UA4A licence um, and I've comp- I completed that. Um, also, there's a, an FA Advanced Youth Award qualification, which I've completed as well, which is they're both level four qualifications. So, um, yeah, that that's as much qu- um, coaching qualification as you can do, bar the UEFA Pro Licence, which is, I mean, the UEFA Pro Licence is mainly for people working in a first team environment. Um, maybe one day... I will look at maybe achieving that award, but for the time being, I'm 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 more than happy with um, the qualifications I've already got from that point of view. Yeah, so like we say, I mean, at level four at the minute is uh, the highest you can gain, and you you've done really well to get. And I think you know one thing you mentioned earlier, and from what I know of you as well, is you know you you continue to learn anyway. You like to read, you like to observe, and watch football and sessions. Um, but, you know, credit to you for being able to, to gain those two. And the Advanced Youth Award is something that is more um, specific to sort of like the, the foundation phase, isn't it? In sort of the, the, the smaller formats of the game, whereas the A licence is sort of predominantly around the 11 aside game and yeah. the older age groups, isn't it? So it's a really good. Um, yeah. Real good blend, the two of them, actually. And um, so the UEFA A licence was more around, like you said, look, the 11 v 11 game, the, the tactics, the technical, the strategies involved with that. Um, and then the advanced youth awards more around the individual player. And that's something I'm probably more passionate about, if I'm being honest, the individual, not just from a technical point of view, but like we spoke earlier, that holistic look at the player, you know, how, how can you help the player from a psychological point of view or a physical point of view? Um, so yeah, that that award focused on that um, aspect, and that's something that I really enjoyed. That that course particularly was probably the most um, enjoyable course I've done so far. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, good. That's good. I mean, um, so you've sort of we've worked at Peterborough now longer than what you would have done in our sort of um, football program, but. You know, could, could you explain any sort of differences or similarities there are between the two? Yeah, so um, like of like I was spoke about earlier, um, there there is a lot of similarities in terms of a you're, you're in a real good learning environment in both both programs. Um, the coaches are invested in development. Sometimes you find that in in different teams or um, certain programs, they're more worried about results and winning and and winning and losing, but what you find in both our program and academy environments and and your own KLE program is the coaches are invested in development of the kids first and foremost. So that's, you know, that's the main similarity. And then you've got both programs have got, um, you know, qualified coaches. You've got good training venues and um, a good fixture and a games program. 
I think the, the difference is, like I spoke about, again, is um, maybe that element of extra pressure in the academy environment mm. where you are, you know, the role of the academy is, is to produce players. That is the nitty gritty of it. Um, whereas maybe your own programme, you, you're, yeah, it would be nice to develop players and you, you always have that um, aim of making players better, but you're also looking at... Um, giving them enjoyable experiences, adding to their existing football provision that they do, but also developing players and coaches for the future mm. um, and people for the future. So we do that. We, Like I said, we, we do a lot of stuff around the person, but our job spec as coaches is purely to develop players first and foremost. And then the other stuff is fitted around that. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, there is differences, um, but I think... Like I said, the similarities are are clear to see, and like I said, the the learning environment is having been in both environments, the where where I am now in the academy, and also the KLE program. The learning environment for the for the kids to develop is the thing that stands out as the biggest um, similarity. Yeah, and ultimately, I guess the biggest difference is you have got a a first team that is investing and you know wants to produce its own players, doesn't it? So, like you say, that's uh, one of the biggest pressures is you've got you know you know the team above you that are you know wanting you know who's next, you know who can play, who's going to be good enough, and they yeah. almost when they get to a certain age they have to be have to be ready, don't they? Which does you know like you say puts a lot of extra pressure on. You know, this person, when they get to this age, you know, we've got to make sure they're ready to step in a very high level of football. Um, yeah, there is that expectation in our environment where, yeah, OK, who's who's the next one? You know, we've produced a player, who's the next one? And there's, and there's that demand, which is a real good demand from us because, you know, I like that pressure, but that pressure is there. Um, it's, just it's, like it's, it's every year, pressure. isn't it? You'll, you'll like you say you'll do it one season and... It, you know, it won't be all right, we got a bit of time off now. It's like, now we've got to be ready for the next one next season and the one after yeah. that. Yeah, there's no, you don't get any chance to rest on your laurels. You have to just keep kicking on and try and improve what we do. And, and yet yeah, we've got to play through well done, but who's next? Who's the next one in line? So that's, that's the mentality we have to have, um, which is, like I said, there's it, pressure involved with it, but is a, for me, it's a positive type of pressure. Yeah. I guess, whereas our program, you know, our, our aim would be that, yes, they all leave us at 16 and they go and join, you know, a football team, um, ideally the highest level, but it's not always, you know, the same one. And, and they all sort of find their, their different, you know, levels, if you like, that they can go into. But the, the ultimate bit is that they, you know, they fell in love with the game of football and, you know, the dropout sometimes from 16 is... is difficult to read sometimes how many people stop playing so yeah the biggest sort of difference maybe is for or the thing for us is that you know we've got to make sure that all these boys want to carry on and going on playing football which I know is one of yours as well but for us that is a priority whereas yours sits you know sits a little bit different but yeah. it's good to see that there are you know lots, still lots of similarities in terms of sort of how the programs run um you know, you've talked to I me, mean, some people will call them sacrifices, but there's, you know, a lot of a lot of time and effort, you know, a lot of um, effort gone into, you know, the hours, uh, the costs for, you know, travelling that you, you know, you may not have been compensated for in the early days. Um, obviously, the rewards can be great. You know, you've just explained to us what position you hold now and you are the only, only member, a uh, player, I, I believe, that would have gone on to, hold a position as head of coaching. So, you know, credit to the choices and, you know, the persistence that you've had to, to get where you are, Matty. But I'm sure on this journey, there's been, um, there's been some setbacks that you've had, you know, what are they and how did you manage them? Just, just give us an example of one or two, maybe. Yeah. Um, so actually, um, so following being employed by Kings and Community Football, following university, I actually, um, went out to China for a real, real brief time. Um, and that particular role didn't work out for me. Um, the, the lifestyle and the, the role was probably different to what I envis sort of imagined it to be. So I actually come home quickly after that for, you know, after a couple of weeks. So I was back in England and I was unemployed at that time. So that 
you know, that's not a nice feeling to be unemployed and it's thinking, okay, what's, what's next? Some, especially someone like me who is really ambitious and wanted to progress, you know, to be unemployed for that brief time is a bit of a weird feeling. So that was a real setback, if you like. But what I've always tried to do is, um, yeah, uh, I'll have maybe some after a frustrating time or a, like you say, a set, setback or a disappointment, I'll feel maybe down a little bit for a short period, but then I've just tried to use that energy in a positive way. And it's always come down to me trying to better myself. Um, as you know, and as, as people that work around me know, I've, I'm, I'm real hungry and, and passionate about self-development. Um, and I think that's a big contributor to why I may be in this position now at a young age is I continually try and develop myself. So in terms of setbacks, that's the only one that springs to mind. But the sacrifices is something probably that I've had to make quite a lot of. We spoke mm. earlier about football and stopping playing, had to stop playing. But moreover than that, the amount of hours I've had to put in and the amount of travelling I've had to put in and the hours I put in now in my spare time to, yeah. to make myself better, um, some would call it obsessive. And they'd probably be right, but yeah. um, I've just got this sort of ambition of mine to keep improving. So that's that fuels that. Um, and that's something that will probably stay with me. I'm probably in a position now, I'm starting to get to a point where I'm managing that better. So yes, I'm still obsessed about getting better, but I can still enjoy aspects of, of other things in life, which to be honest, for, for a period of time, my my energy was all around um, football and making myself better in, yes. in my role and my job. So like I said, I still got that ambition and, and energy to do that, but I'm, I'm managing my overall lifestyle better now. Yeah. Good. Well, that was a, uh, you know, we talk about players, you know, being willing to take risks. That was, um, that was quite a, you know, a big risk, wasn't it? The, the option to go to China, you know, not knowing, you know, the place or exactly what you were going to be in for, um, you know, sometimes it works out. But like you said, it sort of it opened your eyes a bit. And, you know, if you didn't take that risk, you know, you obviously you wouldn't be where you are now or you wouldn't have had that sort of setback that has probably yeah. led you to the decisions that have got you to where you are now. Yeah, um, but exactly. Yeah, really good example, that one. Um we're getting towards here at the end of the questions. Uh, so this will be like a, a couple of quick ones. So best memory as a player and as a coach with KLCF. I know you sort of told us sort of like your goal at Deerham. Yeah, I think um, in terms of overall moment, I think I went on a few tours, I believe, with with Elite Programme. The one that springs to mind, we did a Barcelona tour. I think you went there, actually. Um, you've probably been there a few times. But yeah, we, yeah. we did the Barcelona tour. Um, well, we trained at sort of next door to the new camp, um, and that yeah. that whole experience was brilliant. Not not necessarily just the football aspect of it, just the the life experience of going away. Like it's probably the first time I went abroad without my mum and dad. So you have to you have to learn to look after your own money and things like that, and get yourself out of bed and um, eat the right things and stuff. Obviously, the coaches are there to help you, but it's still more of an independence without your mum and dad being there. Um, and then you just, you're sharing, you're sharing those experiences with, with your mates. And whilst they weren't um, necessarily my best mates to start with, because they went, they went to different schools and played for different teams. What, what I found is them experiences being on tour actually brought you closer to, to those people. Um, so those lads now that I play with, back in when I was like I say 11, 12, 13, 14, I still I'm still friendly with them now. Um uh, uh, create a good relationship with them. So yeah, I think the tours spring to mind the most. And then you, you had uh you, you again full circle you've had a, an experience of being on a tour as a player as well as a member of staff. I think you, you came to the Manchester tour, didn't you, with the younger ones? Yeah, the North, yeah the Northwest one. So that again that's probably the the best experience I've had, the best memory as a coach yeah. for, for you guys. Um, yeah, we went to the Northwest. We, different <laughs> different experiences. I think we went to the Etihad one day and then we went to Accrington Stanley another day. That's and, it, yeah. You know what? I enjoyed 
both equally as much. I think Accrington Stanley game, I remember being freezing cold, but um I think it was uh, the the boys were getting um I think they're hanging around one of the terraces, weren't they? <laughs> we were buying the goal, I remember, yeah. And, and it was different, yeah. isn't it? The Etihad, you weren't, you know, you weren't restricted to your seats. It was still, you know, sort of lower level football, but we were behind the goal and, you know, we were at Accrington yeah. Family Stands for the day, weren't they? Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, I think the tours spring to mind has been the best memories. Brilliant. Good. So, just some quick fire questions, Matt. So, um, currently, best player in world football right now? Yeah, uh, I still I still think Messi. I know Barcelona not having a great time at the minute, but I just think he's probably the best ever. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll go for Messi. Messi, um, all time favorite football boots. I've always been a Predator man, so Adidas Predators, any model really. Probably the Mania, the Predator Manias are probably the nicest ones though. When did you first have them ones? Can you remember Adidas Predator Mania? Uh, must have been ten or eleven, I think. I yeah, think I, yeah. I, I just I had a black pair with a red tongue, and then I was going to say what colour did you go? Pair as well. I think they bought a silver pair out which I had for a little while. Oh, okay. Well, the Beckham's ones maybe were they? Yeah, yeah. Um, pre-match food, post-match food. Pre-match always loved the jack potato with beans and cheese, um, and then post-match probably something a bit less healthy, probably a pizza. Pizza, yeah. Good answer. Uh, what team do you support? Who's your team? I'm a Liverpool fan, so great season last season. This season's been a lot tougher. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last one, tell us something about you that you think nobody really knows. So I don't mean you have to delve into your deeper secrets, but <laughs> uh, there must be something, you know, if one of your, your players or your whoever's listening, you know, tell us something about you that we don't know. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of something exciting. I don't know if we've got anything exciting, really. Um, I'm a, I'm quite a big reader. That's probably something that my players wouldn't realise. I read a lot of books, and not necessarily football books. I'm more into a lot of um, uh, autobiographies and um, leadership books. So I'm a big reader. I know it's not very exciting, but it's probably as good as you're going to get. Uh, well, that's, that's fine. You know, it's always, you know, and that's obviously something that is... Um supported in you getting to you know where you are now so yeah that, that, that question uh is you know answered however you like but what, what i will say though matt is obviously you know thanks for your your time today for you know giving it i know you're still sort of um busy with your head of coaching role and you're actually still delivering um but i think it's been a really good opportunity for anyone around sort of like this area just to you know find out what, what decisions you made and what pathway you've taken. And like I said, there's, there's not many people that have gone on to the, the job role or gain the qualifications that you have got under your belt at the age you are. Um, but, you know, this chat will also give those people the insight as to, you know, well, this can be done. Uh, and I'm sure there's lots of our players that have either just moved on or sort of getting to the age where, you know, you, you've explained some decisions and you weren't really too sure when it came to, you know, going to college or sixth form, you still weren't sure whether he's going to be a PE teacher. Coaching wasn't really even top of the pile then. Yeah. Um, and then just through some choices that you made, it sort of changed the way you look and obviously, you know, where you are now is a, a really good position to be in a full-time job in football is, um, you know, it's very fortunate, isn't it? Because they're, yeah. they're not they're few and far between, they can be. Yeah, it's a really competitive industry. Um, and that's probably that's probably factored in how hard I've, I've, I've realised I've had to work. At an early point, um, probably 18, 19, when I decided that this is the, the route I wanted to go down, I realised how competitive the industry is. But um, I knew if I worked hard enough, I, hopefully I'd get given an opportunity. So... Yeah, I think, um, A, thanks for having me on, but B, hopefully it's helped people realise that, you know, if you if you want to pursue something, you can do if you if you work hard enough. And I'm lucky enough um, that I do something every day now that I really enjoy, and I'm, I'm sure you're the same, Dan. Um, I think it's just around, like you said, choices and, and putting the work in, really. Um, so, yeah, thanks for having me on, and I've enjoyed reflecting on, on loads of different memories.
Yeah, no, I appreciate you being the, the first one, Matthew, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get a, a few more similar uh, similar stories from from players, and you'll be able to to listen to you know you probably might be some players that used to play with or against or in the same team as it might be um, next coming up. Yeah. Okay. All thanks, right. Well, thanks, Matt. Cheers. Cheers.